Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. <clears throat> I brought a message today on television for next Sunday, 7 o'clock, channel 27, that every person in this church ought to hear. It's a very, very important message, and it's very important that you understand what I discussed clearly in the message today. So I hope you'll get up early enough next Sunday morning to listen to the 7 o'clock television program. Verses 7 and 8 of chapter 3. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but dung or refuge, that I may win Christ. I like that next verse, whether it's in my message or not, I want to read it. And be found in him. But I, want you, I do want you to underscore those words, found in him. Be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I'd already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If I would use a subject tonight, it would be the consecrated personal life of a believer. The consecrated personal life of the believer. We're in constant search for the basic cause of the far-reaching problems of the world. Tonight there'll be a debate with two presidential candidates discussing great issues, primarily that have to do with our relation to other nations and the policies that we should follow. Perhaps one of the reasons the answer has eluded us, and it has, in most cases, particularly from the standpoint of national responsibility, is because man wishes to meet life on his own terms. I think this is one of the great faults of people everywhere. I want what I want, and I want it on my own terms. I want to lay the groundwork. I want to tell you what terms we're going to negotiate. This is true on a broad front of the international scene. And it's also true of the intimate family and home problems that we have to face every day of our life. Every day. Life's no easy matter. Life's a little bit complicated. Human relationships are somewhat complicated and they become extremely complicated if we fail to follow the plan that God has given to us in his word. Some people are looking for an easy way out. There isn't an easy way out. We have to adjust ourselves and adopt ourselves uh, to those things that make up life in human relations. And if we fail to do that, we're going to, we're going to really face some problems. Because of this, on the international scene particularly, we say no test ban treaty without meeting my demands. We'll have a form a test ban treaty with other nations if. And there's times when I suppose we need to do that nationally. We certainly need to be strong as a nation 
And we need to guard that strength and the security that we have as a nation. Hence we say no marital accord. Wives and husbands trying to find a place of accord, a place of harmony, a place of uh, where they can be happy and where each one can fill their own place in the home. There'll be no marital accord without coming my way. I'm, it's very easy for me to tell my wife how she ought to conduct herself in our home and say to her, now if you'd do that, our home would be perfectly harmonious. But that's our problem. It's so easy for us to tell other people what to do and we don't stop to consider our own personal responsibility. People come to me to counsel with me about a home problem and, and the wife says, now if you can just get to my husband. But the fact of business is, I've never seen a home problem that wasn't a two-way street. There may be times when it's more one person's fault than it is another. But nine times out of ten, it's two people pulling opposite directions and not willing to give in. I saw a television program announced the other night. I don't know what all it was about, but they announced that the subject of it was, I will not give an inch. And I'm afraid that's the way a lot of people are. I want some giving to be done, but I want you to do all the giving. I'm not going to, to give. I feel that I'm right. How many don't feel you're right? We always feel we're right, don't we? Unless we're dedicated to God and then we know we're wrong. And there's areas of our life that needs to be corrected. But so many times we want it done, but we want it done our way. And so many times we want it done all our way. But equally so, this attitude manifests itself on a spiritual level. And I think more important, perhaps. Man is always trying to bring God to terms, but to his own terms. We're prop, we proposition God. Now, God, if you'll bless me, I'll do so and so. Where do you find that in the Bible? Well, you say Gideon. Yeah, I can argue with that. Gideon put out his fleece. But until you've put out one and it remained dry when there's a big dew on the ground, everything else around it was wet, until you've done that, you quit talking about his fleece. I don't think we today who have the New Testament need to put out fleeces of that nature. Too many times it's not putting out a fleece anyway, it's trying to bargain with God. It's trying to bring God around to our own terms and get God to do what we want Him to do in our way with us. The sinner wants to reserve the right to decide the time and condition of his salvation. Do you ever find about like that? I'm going to be saved, but I had a man even go so far one time that when I'm saved, I want old deacon so-and-so in my home church to deal with me. And I want to go down to the altar in the church where my dad and mother were saved. And boy, he had it all mapped out. The trouble is he died without Christ. So many times we want to, we want to set the terms, even sinners. Yeah, I want to be saved, but my way, on my terms, you know why we have so many denominations today? Because people try and tell God how to save them. The Armenians say, Lord, I want you to save me, but I want you to save me by my works. Church of Christ people say, I want you to save me, Lord, but I want you to do it through baptism. I want you to wash away my sins through baptism. Roman Catholics say, now, Lord, I want you to save me, but... I want you to save me by the catechism I memorize and the masses I go to and the confessions I make and a thousand and one other things. A lot of Protestants says, well, Lord, I want you to save me, but I want you to save me by my church membership and, and by my ability to hold out faithful to the end. Always trying to dictate to God when God's word says, by grace are you saved through faith. And that ought to end it. You say, yeah, but the Bible also says, whosoever shall hold out faithful to the end, the same shall be saved. So you've got to hold out faithful to the end. Trouble is, you never, you never do read the context, you just read the text. The Bible also says that women are saved through childbearing. 
So I suppose a woman doesn't have a child can't be saved. In the first place, in, in regard to the childbearing situation, he was talking about the birth of Christ that came through a woman. He wasn't talking about children you're going to bear otherwise. In the second place, the scripture that says we have to hold out faithful to the end has to do with people during the tribulation period being saved from the tribulation judgments. Doesn't have anything to do with spiritual salvation at all. So many times, because we fail to read the text or the context, we just take a text now and then this seems to say what I want to believe, so I'll use it. The like figure where unto baptism doth also now save us. That ends it. No, it doesn't. It says the like figure. It says that it's a figure of salvation. And it says not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, if you'll read the rest of it, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. But we always want to tell God how to do it. The believer accepts Jesus Christ, but many times reserves the right to live the Christian life in his own way. Now, Lord, I'm saved, and I thank you for saving me. I've accepted Jesus, and I know that I'm saved. Now, I want to decide how often I go to church. I want to decide whether I tithe or not. I want to decide how faithful I'm going to be. I want to decide whether I go to church on Sunday regularly or not. I want to decide on this matter of separation. We accept the free gift of God and then want to dictate to God everything from their own. Now, Lord, you saved me free. Now, I'm going to tell you how I'm going to live for you. It's when self gets into it. It's when the flesh gets into it. It's when self-will gets into it. We begin to make a real mess of our lives. If the believers to know any peace or have any real spiritual power, and we all seek for that, then he must place his all on the altar in full consecration to God. I don't mean a part of it. The end of World War II, one of our great generals, General MacArthur, Met on a ship, the Missouri, wasn't it? And the condition that was laid down was what? Unconditional surrender. Unconditional surrender. Does God require less? Does God expect less of us? You may decide what you do, but you'll also decide whether you have happiness or not. You'll never have any real peace. And you'll never have any real power until you make that full unconditional surrender to Jesus Christ. To one and all, it's unconditional surrender. Consecration is a popular and common term. We say we ought to, we use the word dedication sometime. You ought to consecrate yourself. You ought to dedicate yourself. It's common usage. Everybody come down. If you're not saved, come down and get saved. If you are saved, come down and dedicate your life. Come down and consecrate yourself. It's, it's common usage among Christian people, and yet it has a tantalizing vagueness about it when you get into the Scripture. When you really look into the Word of God, Basically, it's an Old Testament term. It's certainly taught in the principles of it or taught in the New Testament, but it's an Old Testament term, usually associated with the Levitical priesthood and the offerings. Interestingly, it occurs only twice in the New Testament. The word consecration occurs only two times in the New Testament, and both times it's in the book of Hebrews, and that in reference to the priesthood and work of Christ. It still has to do with the priesthood and the work of Christ. In the Old Testament, it was the Levitical priesthood. In the New Testament, it's the priesthood and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the word consecration is used. Now keep in view that practically all Old Testament types and symbols find their fullest expression and fulfillment not in you, 
but in Christ. Most of the Old Testament types find their fullest expression in Jesus Christ. And I have a reason for calling attention to this. If this be true, then personal consecration is reduced to this principle. You say, I want to be consecrated to God. I want my life wholly consecrated to God. And you, you've got to reduce it down to this principle that consecration has to do primarily with Christ. It may be Christ in you. And it may be the effects of Christ being in you. But nevertheless, it comes down to this one great principle. Christ, listen to this, because it's true. Christ became all that we were. He left heaven's glory, condescended, came to earth, took upon himself a body like ours, yet without sin, subjected himself to all the temptations, yet without sin. He became all that we were, that we might become all that he is. What is God's real purpose for your life? God's real purpose for your life is that you will become all that he is. I'm not talking about his original deity, but I'm talking about in the same sense that the apostles were called Christians first at Antioch. They walked like Jesus. They talked like Jesus. Everything that they saw in Jesus, they saw in his disciples. And they ought to see in all of his disciples today. We ought to be like him. This is... This is what it's all about. We're predestinated. Any hyper-Calvinists here, enjoy that for a minute. I'll stop and let you enjoy it. <laughs> but we're predestinated to be conformed to the image of His Son. We're predestinated to be conformed, to be made over into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Every person in this building that's saved ought to be in that stage of being conformed into the image of Christ, made like unto Jesus Christ. You wouldn't have much trouble with consecration if this were true. You wouldn't have much trouble you that go to school and other places where there's discipline. You wouldn't have much trouble with the discipline committee if this was true in your life. It's a dirty, low-down shame that people go to a Christian college and get there and live like the devil in that college. Just stir up Cain. I told them at the very beginning of this year they ought to be mature enough to come here and act like Christian people or they don't, they're not mature enough to be here. But if this, if this were true in our life where we were being conformed to the image of His Son... Every day and every word and every deed, we're trying to be like him. God is shaping us into his image. We wouldn't have much trouble with these other things. These things will begin to disappear. Now, I want to discuss this subject in Philippians from four viewpoints. This matter of consecration is what we're talking about. Everywhere I've ever been, I've told my people, and I'm going to tell you too, I believe you have a responsibility to your church and I believe you ought to be faithful to your church. I don't care if there's a circus in town. And if I didn't want to publicize it, I'd tell you there is. I don't care what's in town. So well, I want to go hear so and so. Now wait a minute. What's your relationship to your church? What's your responsibility to your own church? I believe in being loyal to your own church. I've hurt myself. I've hurt myself sometime by doing that. I've gone back to a town where I've been pastor and everybody knew me, you know. I'd built a big church there and had several thousand people that knew who I was and they all wanted to hear me preach. But I drilled that into them and drilled that into them. I went in that town, held a revival meeting in another church in town. And boy, on Sunday, you didn't see any of them around. Where were they? They were at their own church. Partially because that's what I told them. That's our responsibility. I love my church more than I do any other church. 
I stand by my church, my pastor, my uh, Sunday school teacher, our church. I don't, I don't think we ought to say our church is better than any other church. I just think it's our church. I think my wife's better than any other wife. But I, I don't think there's some terms, if you judge them on certain terms, that might not be true. It certainly wouldn't be true with you. But it's true with me because she's my wife. That makes a lot of difference. This is your church. So to you it's the greatest church. To me it's the greatest church. If it isn't, it ought to be. And we ought to be loyal to it. We ought to be faithful to it. And this is all a part of this matter of consecration. First, I want to discuss it as an affinity. In this golden chapter, which glows with the glory of full surrender, the whole chapter deals with, I'm cruci- I, I, I count all things but loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I mean, it's all giving everything for Christ. Me nothing, Christ everything. Through the entire chapter, Paul gets the, at the fountainhead of consecration in these three simple words that I mentioned to you a moment ago. Found in Him. That I may be found in Him. Where are you found tonight? A lot of, Christians, a lot of professed Christian people are found a lot of places but they're not found in Christ. This is the real fountainhead of consecration. In Christ. In Him. Found in Him. That I may be found in Him. No consecration apart from Him. No consecration but in Him. He is our consecration just as surely as he is our righteousness. The Bible says he is our righteousness. Just as surely the Bible teaches he is our consecration. If consecration were on any other basis, we might brag about it a little. Look what I'm doing doing for Christ. Look at my consecrated life. No Christian can boast in his consecrated life because it's in Christ. It's in him. The things that I now do, I do by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's Christ working in me to will and to do of his own good purpose. We're in Christ. And we can't, we can't get away from that. The appeal for consecration is based upon, first of all, the price he paid. You say, why do you tell me I ought to be consecrated? Because of the price that he paid. If you'll think about that for a moment. Think about the abdication of his throne, the laying aside of his royal robes. Think about his humiliation as he condescends and comes to this earth and takes upon himself the form of man, is made in the likeness of man, is tempted in every fashion as we are. Think about all that he endured as they dogged his steps and heaped indignities upon him and finally hung him on a cross. Think of his suffering on that cross. Think of the scourging preceding. Think of the crown of thorns. Think of all that he suffered and all that he endured. Think of those moments in darkness while the dogs of hell barked at his soul and he suffered indescribable pain that so far exceeds anything that man has ever suffered. There's no way to describe it. And I can only say to you, you ought to be consecrated because of the price he paid for you. The Bible says, ye are not your own. Ye are bought with a price. Therefore, notice how it associates it, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are his. Not yours, which are his. And then second, this appeal for consecration is based upon the blood that he shed. You won't find anywhere in the Bible where consecration of people are separated from the shedding of blood, one way or another. The service of consecration that set apart Aaron and the Levites for the priesthood 
centered in the application of shed blood on the tips of the ears, on the thumbs of their, the thumb of their right hand, and on the great toe of their right foot. That sounds a little strange to us, because we don't have to go through all that today, but if Brother Smith was in the Old Testament days and they were going to consecrate him as a priest, they'd put blood on his right ear. They'd put blood on his right thumb and they'd put blood on his right big toe. I got thinking about that. I'm not sure it's in the lesson. I guess the Lord won't condemn me too much if I add a little to it. It's certainly taught in the scripture. I got thinking about the ear, the hand, the feet. And I thought about three things that involve the Christian. I thought about hearing. You know, you ought to be careful what you hear. It's just as much sin to make your ears a garbage can as it is to be a gossip. You say, I don't gossip, I listen to it. Then you're just as great an offense as the one who gossips. We ought to be careful what we hear. Our ears are consecrated to God. And then our hands work. Most of the work we do, we do with our hands. Other parts of our body enter into it. But most of the thing, I feed myself with my hands. If I got real mad and fought you, I'd fight with my hands. I mean, about everything we do, we do with our hands. Work. And that's what we're saved for. Did you know that? Oh, we love to, we love to quote Ephesians 2, 8. By grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should boast, praise God, I'm a Baptist. But verse 9 says, For we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Why are you saved? Well, I'm saved so I won't go to hell. No, you're not. That's one of the effects of it. Why are you saved? You say, I'm saved so I'll go to heaven. No, that's one of the effects of it. Why are you saved? You're saved to work. You're saved to work. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Somebody say, oh, Baptists don't believe in working. Baptists are the greatest people on the face of this earth and preach stronger on works than any other denomination on the face of the earth. Other people teach you ought to work in order to get saved and escape hell. We teach that after you're saved, you're not going to hell and you're sure of heaven. And you work because you're in Christ and because you love Christ and because he saved you in order that you might work. We ought not, remember, we ought not forget that verse. And then, consecration was based on the mercies of God. You ever stop to think about that? On the mercies of God. I'll quote it to you. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, listen to it. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy. H-O-L-Y, not W-H-O-L-L-Y. H-O-L-Y. Holy, acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. And how's it all come about? By the mercies of God. Consecration based on the mercies of God. Also, it's based on the love that he showed. And here's one of the strongest scriptures, I think, in all the Bible. The love of Christ constraineth us. Literally, it takes hold of us. It takes possession of us and constrains us and causes us to do what we do. The love of Jesus Christ. Then consecration is an act. Paul said, I, I counted all things but loss for Christ. I counted everything loss for Jesus Christ. Our own consecrated personal life begins with a distinct act. A decision, listen to this. A decision to recognize the validity of Christ's claim 
to unconditional surrender. He has a right to claim unconditional surrender from every believer. And now we recognize that claim. If you haven't recognized that claim upon your life, something's wrong, you better go back and start again. Look it over and reevaluate things. Hence, total separation. Now we get into the negative side that so many people don't like. Total separation from his restricted list. The Word of God says, Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And you find it in the New Testament as well as you do in the Old Testament. So I don't like negative commands. Well, you better get used to them because the Bible's full of them. And, and there's negative commands from the day you're born until the day you enter into the presence of God. And those things that are restricted of God, those things that are on His restricted list, we must separate ourselves from. Second, things committed to Christ must not be withdrawn. I'm going to enter a little area right here that I think is very, very important. A fellow comes on and says, I dedicate my life to the Lord. He goes back in three days he loses it. So he comes back and says, I want to dedicate my life to the Lord again. Then he goes back and he forsakes it in a few days and comes back and I want to dedicate my life again. Now, wait a minute. What are you doing? I'm talking about realities tonight. I... I appreciate people, and when you feel like you need to come to this altar and get right with God, you ought to do it. But here's what the Bible says. He says that when we commit ourselves to Christ, it ought to be forever. It ought to be forever. It ought to be a permanent situation. When I dedicated my life to the Lord, just like when I saved. When I saved, I got saved eternally, and I don't doubt my salvation anymore. When I came and dedicated my life to the Lord, I turned my back upon the world and everything that was against God, and I set my eyes like a flint to do those things that would be pleasing in God's sight and to stay off of those things that are restricted. That's not asking too much. That's what God expects as a reasonable service of every child of God. And consecration is an attitude. Consecration is an attitude. Paul said, I count all things but loss. And I want to say to you that consecration without that kind of attitude would be empty and vain. You say, well, I've, I've consecrated my life to the Lord. But you really haven't forsaken everything. You haven't given up everything. You're still holding on to the world a little bit. That's not consecration. You make no mistake about it. That's not real consecration. Consecration is an attitude toward the rightness of Christ's claim upon us for total surrender. Therefore, we make that total surrender. This attitude is his expression toward spiritual life. He said, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ. It's not, however, just our agreement with Christ's claims. You say, well, yes, I agree that Christ has a right to make these claims upon me. But consecration involves more than that. It involves our involvement in those claims. Our involvement. A lot of people say, yes, I believe in the church, but I'm not going to be involved in it. Yes, I believe in good government, but I'm not going to be involved in it. Now, the things that we don't get involved in, we don't, we don't help very much, do we? They don't, it doesn't mean very It doesn't become a personal experience. It doesn't become a personal thing with us at all. It, yes, we must acknowledge his right, the right of his claims upon us for total surrender, but it's how much we become involved in those claims and giving them to him, yielding them to him. That really counts. And you know, when we, when we do that, our values are regulated in every area of our life. When we acknowledge the claims that Christ has upon our life for total surrender, and we become involved in it so that it becomes a reality and an experience in our life, then it affects our home life, it, expects, it, it affects our social life, it, it affects our attitudes, it, it affects everything about us. Everything about us. And then consecration is a name. Paul expressed it simply, to win 
Christ. To win Christ. This is my aim. I, I count all things but loss that I might win Christ. Now three things are important to observe in regard to Paul's aim. First, to know Christ. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering. This involves a spiritual intimacy with Christ. Not just a, a, a head knowledge, an outward knowledge, but a spiritual intimacy with Christ. I know him. I understand him. He's a part of me. I am conformed to his image that I may know him. And second, to lay hold of Christ. He said to lay hold of Christ. This is spiritual maturity. I believe that Christian life is a life of spiritual growth. That's what sanctification is really as far as a Christian life is concerned. It's not something that just necessarily happens all of it at one time, but we're in the process of sanctifying ourselves completely to the Lord, and we grow in grace and knowledge, and we come to maturity and become adult in the Lord. Paul said, when I was a baby in Christ, I drank milk. And now I'm a grown person in Christ, I eat meat. We grow like a baby grows. They get out of the milk stage into stronger food stage. Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. And then last, to look for Christ. To look for Christ. A spiritual expectancy. And I'm talking here about the second coming of Christ. The Christian who's mature, the Christian who's consecrated is the Christian who is looking for the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. Do you live in constant expectancy of the coming of Christ? That'll affect your life more than any one thing I know of. I must really live for him today. I must let him have my full life today. I'm expecting him any moment. I'm looking for him any moment. May we stand, please, with our heads bowed.